This is Dr. J. Welcome to Thesising 101, where I'm running out of taglines. In the series, we cover tips and tricks to help you on your research journey. To returning viewers, thank you for your continued support. To first-time viewers, welcome. If you like what you see, please like and subscribe. Today's focus is on research design strategy. Let's get right into it. In our previous tutorials, we spoke about philosophies and research design approaches. Today, we are going one level deeper into our research design onion, and we are exploring different research strategies. There are seven research strategies that we will be exploring, namely experiments, survey, case study, action research, grounded theory, ethnography, and archival research. It's very important to note that these are not mutually exclusive. Example, one can make use of a case study research strategy while incorporating a survey research strategy. Like everything else we have done up to this point, the research strategy you select is guided by your research question. If I said it once, I've said it a thousand times. The better defined your question, the easier the research design becomes. FYI, if you're looking for information on a specific type of research strategy, I've added time tags to this video so you can hover over the progress bar and it should indicate which strategy we are dealing with at a specific point. Just trying to make it as easy as possible for you to get what you need and get on with your day. Right, let's start with experiments. The purpose of experiments are to understand causal links between an independent variable and a dependent variable. With this type of research, you, as the researcher, manipulates the independent variable and observe its effect on the dependent variable. The simplest type of experiment is to establish if there is a causal relationship at all. However, you can use multiple independent variables in more complex experiments. Here's an example of a classic experiment. We are trying to establish if a new drug improves concentration in children. So the dependent variable are the kids' concentration. And in our scenario, we are giving them a puzzle to complete and we'll measure concentration based on how long it takes them to complete the puzzle. Your independent variable will be the drug. Since the independent variable is a thing you are manipulating, you can create different scenarios involving the drug. You may choose to create multiple groups and usually in a classic experiment, you can create an experimental group and a control group. The way you decide which kids should go into which group should be by random assignment to minimize other factors influencing the results. In the experimental group, you will administer the drug and in this scenario, we'll go simple and say group A gets half a dose and group B gets a standard dose. In our control group, we will not be administering the drug at all because we need to compare the results from the experimental group to the control group to show if the drug actually made a difference. So again, let's go simple and administering a placebo to group C and no drug at all to group D. At the end of the day, you will document the results in the different groups, perform analysis and make an inference based on the data. Example, yes, drug X improves concentration in children. As mentioned before, in an experiment, the focus is on causal relationships between variables or constructs, which means the experiment research strategy goes well with research questions that starts with why and how. If you recall in the previous video, we said that how and why questions are usually associated with explanatory and exploratory research. In addition, experiments are associated with quantitative data collection and analysis. Next up, we have the ever popular survey research strategy. A common misconception is that the survey research strategy only uses the questionnaire data collection technique. Other techniques in the strategy include structured interviews, where you have a list of predefined standard questions you ask of participants, and structured observations, where you keep meticulous notes of what you are observing. The survey research strategy is mostly associated with a deductive research approach. To refresh your memory, the deductive approach says we start with a theory, we create a hypothesis based on the theory, and then we test the theory to see if our hypothesis is supported or not. Think about it, if you don't start with a theory, it's a little difficult to know what questions to ask or what to observe. Speaking of what to ask and what to observe, the strategy is very useful when you have a large population and you want to answer who, what, where, how much and how many research questions. Usually it is very impractical to obtain data from all in the population, so we draw a representative sample and try to get the answers from them. Since we are asking these type of questions, the survey research strategy is usually associated with exploratory and descriptive research. The survey research strategy creates a platform where the researcher can collect quantitative data and perform descriptive or inferential statistics. Very quickly, descriptive statistics is all about organizing and describing data using graphs and numbers. 
A histogram or a pie chart, for instance, is an example of describing data using a graph. You may have seen this in studies where we calculate the mode, median and mean, and that is an example of describing data using numbers. Inferential statistics is drawing conclusions based on the data you organize and describe using graphs and numbers. The statistical analysis we do can provide us with insights to give reasons for the relationships between variables in models, or even allow us to create new models. Next on our list, we have case study research. Think of a case study as the opposite of an experiment. In both instances, we are observing a phenomenon, but in the experiment, we are manipulating the context, whereas in a case study, we want to observe the phenomenon and its natural environment. We use case studies when we want an in-depth knowledge of a phenomenon and its context. Here's an example of a case study. You are interested in understanding how teachers use technology in the classroom, so your case study will be on a school or multiple schools that are using technology to teach. From personal experience, I can tell you justifying the case study research strategy takes a little bit of work because the point of research is to generalize findings. The case study strategy inherently has a small sample, so of course its generalizability is often critiqued but not all research have the express purpose of generalizing to population. By the way, generalizing to population goes a little something like this. There is a community of 100 people. You take a random sample of 20 people to find out how many of them like ice cream. 18 out of the 20 says they do. Based on these results, you make an inference that there is a 95% probability that 90% of the entire population, which was 100 to begin with, like ice cream based on the 20 that you surveyed. But case studies doesn't always have the same luxury of that type of generalization. However, it is an excellent form of generalizing to theory. Okay, this is what I mean by that. Good case studies can help you challenge existing theories. It can also help you discover and highlight complexities in these theories. You may find a real-life solution to a real-life problem when doing a case study, and that of course contributes to theory. And it is a great platform for obtaining unexpected insights into a phenomenon and contributing to theory in that way. This means case study research is very useful when you have an exploratory and explanatory research purpose. It is great for answering why, what and how research questions. When doing case studies, you have to collect many different types of data, and we use this to triangulate our findings. Triangulation is a method by which you can show rigor and demonstrate what you think you are seeing is what you are actually seeing. For instance, you can collect data via interviews, documents, observations, even questionnaires, and the findings that you see in one method are sort of backed up by the other methods. I'll do a separate video on triangulation because there are many different ways you can do this. When deciding on a case study, you need to choose between a single or a multiple case study. Again, this decision is driven by your research problem. Single case studies are great for extreme or unique cases. Well, it is also sort of great for typical cases too. And a multiple case study is great for generalization because you can check if the findings in one case are the same as the findings in other cases. Something else to decide on is a holistic case study versus an embedded case study. When doing a holistic case study, you are looking at the case in its entirety. An embedded case study, on the other hand, is when you have multiple unit of analysis that you are investigating. All right, research strategy number four, action research. A major differentiator between action research and the other research strategies we've covered thus far is that action research is not merely focused on observing. Action research is focused on implementing an action and through multiple research iterations, improving or refining this action. This action we are implementing is improving on an existing way of doing things, for instance. Action research are based on the following pillars. 1. It is research in action. The research is trying to solve a real-life problem. 2. The solution is implemented by the researcher in collaboration with the people who are directly affected by the problem itself. 3. It is iterative. Let's take a closer look at that. When you are doing action research, you start with diagnosing the problem, which include doing a lit review to understand the problem in more depth. We then do some planning on how to solve the problem, then we are getting the research participants involved to take the action to solve the problem, and then evaluate its effect. 
Since problems are rarely solved on the first try, we would use the results of the evaluation, diagnose the problem again and repeat. You do this as many times it takes to solve the problem. Back to the pillars. The fourth pillar of action research is that the action taken in your study should have implications beyond the research you are conducting, meaning your findings must be applicable to other contexts. Because of the nature of action research, it is great for answering how questions. Now let's look at strategy number five, which is grounded theory. Think of grounded theory as a theory building strategy, where the focus is on building theories around people's behavior. This strategy is especially useful when existing theory on the behavior is sparse. For instance, you are interested in understanding how people get addicted to social media. Imagine this is more than a decade ago, where there are multiple studies done on other types of addiction, but because social media is new, studies surrounding social media addiction doesn't really exist. Enter Grounded Theory. Grounded Theory is based on a combination of the inductive and deductive research approaches. If you are still confused as to the differences between these approaches, please check out my video for an explanation. Grounded theory is inductive in the sense that you start with making a series of observations. And in order for you to make these observations relating to your research problem, you must find a group of people that exhibit addictive behavior regarding social media through theoretical sampling. On a side note, observation in our example doesn't necessarily mean you watch the participants become addicted to social media. Observation in this sense means that you are collecting data that will eventually inform a theoretical framework that can explain the process of becoming addicted to social media. And in grounded theory, data collection is usually qualitative, and in our example could be that you are doing interviews with participants. So we would ask them, hey, how did you become addicted? What do you think are the contributing factors of you becoming addicted? Well, a little bit more, you know, diplomatic than that, but essentially that's what you would ask them. As mentioned before, to do grounded theory, we also need to follow the deductive research approach. So when the grounded theory researcher make their initial observation, they generate predictions, which then need to be tested by doing further observations. These further observations are done either to confirm or refute these predictions. So practically, this is what it may look like in our example. We create our theoretical framework based on our initial observation, get an entire new group of people who exhibit addiction to social media and pretty much ask them the same questions. And of course, this means we will refine our theoretical contributions based on the analysis we do on this set of data. One thing to remember is that the theory you build in the grounded theory research strategy is only based on the data you collect in the study. So in our example, the theoretical framework we create will be grounded in our raw data. But this does not mean that 1. Grounded theory is merely a presentation of raw data. You still need to analyze the data and present insights. I will create a separate video on analyzing qualitative data and the presentation thereof. And 2. It also doesn't mean that you can ignore doing a literature review. And this is a common misconception when it comes to grounded theory. All right, penultimately, we've got ethnography. The purpose of ethnography is to describe and explain the social world as per the lived experience of the people in that specific social context. In order to do this, the researcher has to emerge themselves into the social context as completely as possible. That means that you need to be part of the community you are observing and you need to be a researcher at the same time. Since the aim of ethnography is to understand the world through the eyes of the subject, this research strategy follows the inductive research approach, as in we do observations and come up with theories. Now I know that sounds a lot like grounded theory, but grounded theory is interested in finding emerging patterns and developing theories based on those patterns, while ethnography is interested in making generalizations about a specific group of people from a holistic perspective. Because the researcher has to emerge themselves, these types of studies take a long time to do and is of course longitudinal in nature. As in the researcher is not just taking a snapshot of the context by doing a few interviews over like a two day period. Ethnography requires observation over an extended period of time. So data collection will be qualitative in nature as it would include the technique of participant observation. 
This means there are a few things that you need to take into consideration if this is your research strategy. First, you need to ensure that the community you identify for your study will be able to answer your research questions. And you need to be able to build trust with the subjects as you are going to be part of this community. Last but not least, let's look at archival research. In an archival research strategy, the principal source of data is that of administrative records and documents. This means that the archival researcher would need to go to the place where the organization, government, or whatever entity their study is based on, stores the administrative records. In the past, this meant that the researcher would need to drive to a specific location, but with more and more entities digitizing their records, this can now be accessed through the internet, granted you have the right permission, of course. While the word archive may sound like only really old and dusty material is in play, that is not true. Archival research can make use of recent material. This material can be anything from documents, newspapers, memos, audio clips, anything that the entity your research is based on created as part of their day-to-day -day operations. There are a couple of things that you need to take into consideration when it comes to archival research. One, these archives were not created with your research in mind. Therefore, the archival researcher may run into issues like data that does not precisely answer their research question or data that is censored or even missing data. Another thing the archival researcher must take into consideration is the context in which these material were created to preserve the original meaning and intent of these materials. And that is all for me today. If you have a question, please add it to the comment section. Like this, share this, subscribe to this. This is Dr. J signing off.